Well, good afternoon, Bethel Baptist Church, and uh, thank you for tuning in to the second week of this uh, teaching on church polity. Uh, last week, I introduced uh, exactly what I'm hoping to accomplish with this series. Uh, I'd like to address church polity, uh, which means how the church governs itself. And as I made the case last week, this is something we usually uh, push to the side. And yet the way in which the church understands itself to be governed or structured has major impact on the way uh, the church understands and implements its mission to exalt Jesus Christ as Lord. And because uh, we believe here at Bethel that's so important, we want to we want to take some time to, to walk through this and think through these ideas. Uh, with that being said, last week I said that uh, my, my purpose this week is that we would look at different types of church polity um, and, uh, and try to understand exactly what are different ways in which churches govern themselves. Um, uh, I think that church polity or the types of governments that you'll see in churches fall under a large spectrum. Uh, and uh, with some help of brothers here at Bethel, uh, Baptist came up with a pretty simplistic diagram uh, that I'm going to share with you all here uh, for you to uh, be able to look at. And it's not super complicated, but I hope that this little diagram here helps you. Uh, and so I, I see it on a spectrum here. And so uh, where you're at on the spectrum is where you think uh, more or less authority is vested into whom. On the left, you'll see more authority being vested into the congregation. And on the right, you'll see more uh, authority vested into some sort of ruling leadership, ruling polity. And so I think that on this spectrum, there are three main categories of church structures. On the far left, you have pure congregationalism. Uh, this is the type of polity that holds that authority lies almost exclusively with the congregation. Uh, now, as you can see under that, I had a hard time finding examples because there really isn't many examples. I'm sure there are. I'm just not thinking of them uh, because most churches wouldn't say out loud that their leaders have no authority. However, what you'll see is that practically speaking, their leaders don't have much authority and the leadership must submit to the congregation on every point. And this usually comes out in some form of mob rule. Uh, you'll see a lot of Robert's rules of orders being going on at these churches. Uh, it's practically a church that votes on every topic. Uh, some signs of this might be that you'll find a long line of pastors that they can't uh, maintain a, a pastor there or the pastor who's there is kind of a pushover and uh, is pushed around by the congregation because they just simply can't do anything. Uh, so that's on the far left. And on the far right, you have what I call ruling polities or ruling polity. Uh, this is a types of polity in which all authority lies with whoever the leaders are and the congregation doesn't have any. And there are plenty of examples of this uh, Episcopal form of polity. Uh, this is what you would think of like the Catholic Church. This is where there's a hierarchy of bishops or something to that effect that holds sway over churches as a whole. So a hierarchy of bishops uh, that then kind of go down and then out to the churches. Uh, also, you will see Presbyterian polity would fall under this, in which there are chosen representatives from uh, different congregations in different areas in which they go to what's called the synod. And then these kind of representative leaders have all of the authority over what's happening in the churches and they participate in these large councils. Uh, then there's elder rule, which doesn't usually hold the difference between elder rule and something like Presbyterian or Episcopal polity is that elder rule doesn't typically hold that there's some outside authority. There's still believe that authority lies within that autonomous local church, but it is solely invested in the elders. So the congregation doesn't have any, but the leadership has it all. But it's not like that leadership is submitting to some outside council in any way. Uh, and so that's that would be kind of variations under the ruling polity. And then in the middle, you have a mixed polity. And this is the one that recognizes that there is an element of authority that's given both to the congregation and the leadership, that they have real authority in the life of the church. An example of this, and I think what would be the most biblical would be uh, elder-led congregationalism, and that's kind of where we're going to be going. Uh, on a final note of this diagram, before I get into what I see being some of the pitfalls of either side of this, uh, the two edges here from the pure congregationalism to the ruling polity, I, I want you to notice that there is a spectrum under each of the three categories. You can have churches 
that would be under a specific category and be more or less extreme based on how they practice their church governance. For instance, a church that is elder rule may still have the congregation participate in things which would be much less extre extreme than a, an a, a Episcopal type of church government. So I, I don't, I don't want to pigeonhole any churches or their governments. Just because a church has done Robert Rule of Order doesn't mean they're on the furthest extreme left they could possibly be. There's spectrums within each of these. And so this isn't foolproof. This isn't the only way to do this. But as I see it, there are these three basic kind of views of church polity. And the question that we're asking here is where does authority lie? Does it ally with just the leaders? Does it lie with just the congregation? Or does it lie with both in some way? Uh, now, as it will become clear in the following uh, weeks, I believe that a mixed polity is the most biblical. And for the next few weeks, we're going to not necessarily be discussing whether or not the elders or the congregation has authority, but the question for the middle category is what exactly the authority granted by God to each is. Not whether they have it, but what is that authority? And so the debates in that middle category really are what should it look like on a day-to-day -day basis. However, that's not what we're going to do today. For the rest of our time, I want to look at what I think are uh, four dangers, four dangers of, of a pure congregationalism and a ruling authority polity. Uh, because I actually think that both sides of this fall into the same trap and don't even realize it. So four dangers of both of them. First, I think both pure congregationalism and ruling polities misunderstand biblical authority, misunderstand biblical authority. Pure congregationalism fails to see that God really does give authority to leaders. Sheep don't boss around shepherds. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Real authority has been given to leaders in the church, and you will never see biblical injunctions anywhere for leaders to submit or to obey people. Real God-given authority has been given to leaders. Leaders are not just figureheads that you just have to deal with to get what you want across. They really have authority granted by God. However, Ruling polity, I think, fails to realize that God really does give authority to the congregation as well. Maybe here an analogy would be helpful. Uh, think about a husband and wife relationship. Scripture clearly teaches that a husband is the authority in the home. Wives are to submit to their husbands. But we may ask at this point, does this mean that the wife has no authority in her home at all? What if the husband came in and said, you are not allowed to parent your children anymore. As the authority of this house, you can't parent your children anymore. Uh, you can't give them instruction. You're not allowed to discipline. Wives should step up at this point and say, no, you do not have the authority to do this. And if they said that, they'd be right because God has given wives authority over their children. Just because ultimate authority and leadership is given to husbands doesn't mean that the wife is devoid of all authority. And I think that you can look at most authority structures that God has put in the world and see that this is how it works. God grants leadership authority, but that does not mean that those under that leadership never have authority in any circumstances. There are times in which they do. And so I think that the congregation, what, what ruling polity fails to see is that the congregations, believers in general, really have been given authority by God in the world. Now, what that authority looks like on both sides and the texts that support it, that's going to be the discussion of future videos. And so I'm not going to get into that this week. But first, I think that both pure congregationalism and ruling polities misunderstand biblical authority. Secondly, I think both forms of church polity live in a state of fear, live in a state of fear. Pure congregationalism uh, it starts from a place of mistrusting leadership mistrusting leadership because leaders are those who are power hungry. They're after their own gain. You can't put any trust in man. And because of that, around every corner, there is someone who is a wolf, who is out to seek power, who's trying to dominate you in some way. And you don't want to be dominated by anyone. And so you don't want to give too much authority to uh, these men. And because of that, most forms of authority are mistrusted. And when that happens, I think the congregation misses out on the blessing of God that he gives in good authority. 
And further, because there is so much red tape, because you're so afraid of authority, because you're so afraid that no one can be trusted, nothing ever moves forward. Nothing ever gets done. Everything has to stop. The mission has to stop because you're constantly having to go through red tape. And so I think that what pure congregationalism runs into is a constant fear of authority. Now, ruling polity, I think, on the reverse, mistrusts their people. And, and because they mistrust the people, they do not empower them to use their authority to do what God has commanded. Around every corner, there is someone in the congregation who is seeking their power and trying to dominate them. Everyone could possibly be a wolf in sheep's clothing. All forms of the congregation questioning them or seeking to do something is seen through the lens of, well, what if they're trying to come after our authority? And, and so when this happens, I think that the, the elders or the leadership in the church miss out on the blessing God has given the congregation as ministers of the gospel. The leadership is in constant fear that the congregation is going to overstep their bounds or, or jump off the cliff of, of, of a false doctrine or do something like that. They're in constant fear of that, that they create so much red tape that they won't allow people in the congregation to do lasting ministry. They won't allow people in the congregation to move forward with things because they're in constant fear of the congregation. So secondly, I think both forms live in a state of fear. Third, I think both forms of church polity place the mission of the church uh, second. I'm not going to spend much time here because this is what I covered last week, but pure congregationalism tends to focus so much on administrative tasks and takes authority that is not theirs that they miss the bigger picture. The congregation's authority isn't in what carpet the church gets or how the services, I think, should be structured or a whole host of other things. The congregation's authority primarily lies in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Let me say that again. The authority of the congregation primarily lies in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. The church is the pillar and buttress of truth. Truth. The church holds the keys of the kingdom. The church is in a battle for souls, and it's the church that puts on the whole armor of God. The church has the authority to wield the gospel of truth with great power. And I think when the congregation takes authority that is not theirs, they are missing out on something much more beautiful that they have the authority to do. Ruling polity, I think, tends to function much more like a business than a church. It is so top-down heavy that it does not free the congregation to rightly use their God-given authority and to do their job well. Similarly to what happened on the other side with pure congregationalism, they are so focused on administrative tasks of running the church that they miss the blessing of seeing the gospel advance. It, it's a CEO who holds the reins so tight that the people in the congregation don't really know what they can do or should be doing. And they're, they're so worried about making sure people stay within their bounds that it misses the freedom that comes with letting other people do their jobs without you, wielding their authority without you. And I think most importantly, it doesn't give the authority that Jesus has given to the church that you see in the Great Commission. When, when Jesus says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go make disciples. If the congregation doesn't have the authority to make disciples, then it doesn't make any sense. So that's third. Fourth, I think. Uh, summarizing all of this, the danger of both is what Jonathan Lehman brings up in his book. Both forms of these church polities thwart biblical discipleship. They thwart biblical discipleship. When the congregation does not give over authority to its leaders, it is missing out on being discipled by those leaders who are to be teachers. The primary thing that a, a pastor, an elder, which I'll be using uh, interchangeably, the primary responsibility of an elder pastor is to teach, to train the flock. And, and if they don't have the authority to do that well, uh, then you're missing out on being discipled. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ. The leaders are supposed to have authority so that they can rightly train and disciple you. And if that's not there, you're missing out. But ruling polity fails in this as well, as they do not think, they do not see that their authority is primarily the authority of discipleship an authority to train and equip others to do ministry well. Their authority lies in the fact that they have been given by God the authority to train the church how to be, as First Peter says, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of whom who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So thus, because of these four dangers, and because I think the Bible demands it, I think that a mixed polity is best. Now, there are many questions and much more biblical support needed than what I've been able to provide in this short 15-minute video. Uh, but this is where we're going to go in the weeks ahead, as especially next week, we start diving into the scriptures to see what it has to say of this. So hold on tight. In the next few weeks, we are going to be diving into uh, what exactly the authority that's been given to the congregation and the leadership are. And so we're going to start next week with looking specifically at the authority of the congregation. And so we're going to look at the storyline of scripture to see how the Bible storyline teaches us of the congregation's authority. So thank you all for joining me this week. I hope it was helpful for you. Uh, and remember that if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email is marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at bbckc.org. Again, that's marty at bbckc.org. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to seeing you next week.